Um, I'm Francesco Tomagni. That's those are my handles, and um, yeah, that's pretty much a spoiler of what the kind of stuff uh, we can do. Basically, I wrote uh, an I/O plugin for Radar in order to be able to uh, see and manipulate the data files of the game. And in this talk, I will show both the thought process behind the reversing of, the, of it and also uh, the design of the I.O. plugin. So Thimbleweed Park is uh, made by the same guys which worked on the original Lucasfilm uh, adventure games back in the 80s, but it has been released uh, the last year like, in, like an indie game. Uh, if you don't know it, you can go there and get it. Uh, I bought it twice but <laughs> because I needed to understand what changes across different platforms. Uh, it's available for a lot of platforms, including uh, consoles and mobile. I bought only the macOS versions for Steam and the standalone one. Um, so we're focu focused on the data files of the game, which contain uh, all the resources of the game, but also some of the logic. <laughs> uh, they are obfuscated, obviously, but uh, fortunately it's not so hard. <laughs> uh, the, those are packet files which are found in the game's data folder. So the first thing I'll show you is how to find out where the loading code is and where the, the obfuscation happens. So I have here, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a couple of terminals here. OK, so in one tab, I will show the uh, I will spawn the game using your to Frida. Oops. Um, so that we can um, uh, see where uh, the, the things are loaded. In the other tab, I will load the the executable, so we can analyze it statically with R2. Uh, I'll do that now because so that it runs some emulation while. We are doing the dynamic stuff. <laughs> and so the game has been spawned. Uh, we don't see it yet because uh, it's uh, suspended. So we can apply early instrumentation with Frida. And uh, I'm going to trace if open. Uh, that's a normal error. Don't care about it. <laughs> uh, in this way, I can tell her to Frida that we want uh, to see also the first parameter of the function as a string. Um, now the process is still suspended, but uh, if I resume it, it will start to spit out stack traces and the file name. So we're, we're seeing that uh, it's calling f open uh, uh, enormous amount of times, uh, and that's because this uh, file contains, it's like uh, 500 megabyte files, uh, which contains thousands of resources. So apparently, every time it needs to load something, it will f open and do something. So those stack traces look almost all the same. But at some point, yeah, the game is starting up, but we are slowing it down a bit for the instrumentation. Uh, now the stack trace changes, but it's still loading. <laughs> so just wait for it to finish, it not, will not take too long. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much the same stack trace. At, at some point, it will start to load also other stuff, which is not our uh, ggpack file. Uh, almost there, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> OK, uh, so, okay. so it finished. Uh, now, I want to find the first one. <laughs> which is this. So this is the first uh, time it calls this fopen with that file. And uh, yeah, 
um, just focus on the first two entries of the stack trace. Uh, remember those offsets now for a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, w what we can do with our 2 freedom now, uh, thanks to a recent addition by Pancake, is doing this. Uh, in this way, we, we can display uh, the call graph based on the combination of all those stack traces. And uh, so you can see there, there there's a, the F open, and here there are, there's the first entry of our stack trace. <laughs> and this is the second one. So we're interested in, the, in those two. Um, so, in the other tab, uh, the analysis is finished, so we have just analyzed all functions and emulated, so we can find references, but let's seek to the first offset here. So, indeed it's calling fopen, and uh, yeah, let's follow this code real quick. So after fopen it will uh, uh, fseek, and then after the f it will uh, unlock a buffer and then uh, call f read. So, and this happens every single time it's calling f open. So that means that uh, here uh, it defines what part of the file it, uh, it wants. So basically, uh, those buffer will contain our single resource. Uh, if we go on, uh, okay. No, oh, sorry. Not the F close. <laughs> okay, so after uh, free the okay here. Yeah. We can see uh oops. Okay, this one. Uh what happens after the F read is this. Uh, if you're familiar with C++ reversing, you can spot that his, here it's constructing a, a C++ object because uh, here is reading a pointer, which is a, um, and adding 10 and storing it here. That means that's a V table. Um, so we can quickly show this. Okay, so uh, this is the actual V table with all the methods. We are not interested in this now, but we can see that there are also other metadata, like for example the class name here. So this GG data class is a C++ class which represents the abstract resource which is contained on the packet file. So now let's go to see the, the second function <laughs> and. Uh, so yeah, after after calling this function, which just we just saw that creates an object. Oh yeah, no, I forgot something. Um, we have to see uh, that um, here. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah, here uh, after setting the V table, it sets also other fields. Uh, those two are interesting because uh, at offset 18 hexadecimal, there's the uh, buffer, the pointer to the buffer itself, and at offset 20, there's the size of the buffer. So we have to remember this stuff throughout all the talk. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's stick again to the second function. Okay, so after calling our function, which returns actually, that, that object, uh, if, if everything goes well, is returned here. So if it's not uh, null, <laughs> I mean, it does some stuff and then does this. So it, it's accessing here the size of the buffer. This is accessing the buffer pointer itself. And here we can see that's already the obfuscating stuff right away. So um, what does here is uh, accessing the uh, this global variable here, reading it byte by byte. It turns out that's, that's a 16 byte uh, hard coded array, which looks random stuff, but it's not because it's a coded. So, uh, and it's 
uh, XORing the content of the buffer. This is only one byte, but then there's there's a loop here which does pretty much the same stuff. There's also a constant here, hard coded, which is get which gets multiplied uh, by the index of the byte inside the buffer. So, but uh, we will see that in the in depth now. So that's so we found uh, where it opens the file and where the, the obfuscation logic is. So now um, let's focus on the obfuscation. So basically, uh, each chunk is a chunk is the obfuscated independently. That means uh, chunks the, uh, for me are the single resources which are packed in the file. Uh, they are obfuscated independently. It means that. Uh, um, Every chunk has a parameter which changes for for every resource, so you can't just unobfuscate all the file, but you have to deobfuscate the single chunks. And uh, what changes is just the size, because it depends on the size of the chunk. The other two parameters are constant across all the chunks, and uh, are the two we already saw. So the, there's a 16 bytes array and a constant. Uh, those are the same again uh, across the chunks, but can change across different versions of the game and across platforms. So, for example, macOS standalone and macOS Steam may have different parameters. So, um, actually, there was an, an early proof of concept for deobfuscating these files on GitHub uh, that I used as a starting point for this, but it was incomplete uh, because the abstraction is wrong. So the deobfuscation works like this. So in the, the red bytes at the top are the obfuscated bytes you can find in the file. Instead, the green ones are the deobfuscated ones consumed by the game. In the middle, there's the this obfuscation algorithm, which basically is very simple. It's every byte is XORed with the previous one, except the first, which is XORed for the, with the last byte of the size of the chunk. That's why every chunk is different. Uh, the second step is to XOR it for with the 16 bytes key. But since it's only 16 bytes, it gets repeated. But to not repeat the key every time the same, uh, it also XORs each uh, of the key bytes with this multiplied constant by the index. So that's it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's completely reversible. Yeah. And it's interesting to note that each, each obfuscated byte depends on the previous obfuscated byte. Uh, so uh, the, the structure of the ggpack file is this. So the red stuff is obfuscated. Uh, at the beginning, there are clear, clear text uh, integers, one representing the offset of the index in the file uh, and the size of the index, uh, which is a dictionary which is stored at the end of the file. It's a binary dictionary encoded in a proprietary format here, which is uh, compatible with JSON, one-to-one, -one. Uh, but it's binary, so I had to reverse that. So. Uh, the IO plugin uh, performs the, the obfuscation and obfuscation, and you can modify the, the thing, and you can discover what's inside that. Source code of the plugin is there. Um, okay, so uh, this uh, the, the IO plugin in general creates an abstraction to the user of what actually is the data. In this case, the the red stripe at the bottom is the obfuscated file as it is on the disk. The red stripe at the top, the <laughs> the green stripe at the top is the it's what the user sees, but uh, that's an abstraction because uh, uh, the IO plugin is asked for uh, read uh, in a uh, block by block, so it's random. But we have to know which are the chunks involved because the obfuscation depends on that. And uh, but the user will not notice it. So uh, it's like a continuous uh, stream of uh, clear text, which is not there actually. Um, and that's true for our plugins. Uh, the same. Exactly the same reason reasonment here. Uh, I applied it to like the the wild cache uh, for iOS. So you have to rebase pointer on the fly. 
so you, you do the same. Uh, you, you have an index, look up what, what are the chunks involved and defuscate the piece you want. Uh, the only mm, trick here is that if we don't obfuscate it from the beginning, we have to read the, the obfuscated byte at the offset minus one from the file directly. So. Because every obfuscated byte depends on the previous one. Uh, for writing, it's pretty much the same. The only thing that changes is that you can't just stop writing at the end of the block the IO plugin wants to write. You have to go write until the end of the chunk, again, because every obfuscated byte depends on the previous one. So even if the real content is not changed, the obfuscation will change. So let's see. Uh, for inserting bytes, um, it's a bit of a mess because problem is uh, obfuscation depends on the size, and we are actually changing the size. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and yeah, also uh, what happens is that the um, uh, core of Radar actually performs the shift uh, after calling the um, uh, our resize function in the I/O plugin. So there is no uh, notification when the the shift has finished, so I made a hack, which is to listen for the uh, first write on the last chunk after the resize. So that's the moment in which the shift is finished. And that's needed because after um, updating the offset and sizes and re-obfuscate all the thing, when the shift is finished, we have to rebuild the index uh, at the end of the file. And also rebuild the flags, because there's a, a really Thin bin plugin which only does the flags for a flag for each of the chunks. So we have to call the the core plugin from the IO plugin. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. that's a bit a mess, but it works. Uh, for deleting bytes, it's pretty much the same, uh, but here it's the opposite. So when we get called from the IO when the IO plugin get called uh, for the resize callback. The shift uh, has been already uh, has already happened. So what happens is that our index is a, uh, has an offset. So the contents are already changed, but the boundaries of the chunk are wrong. So yeah, he just uh, now he we just uh, have to update it. So the shift already happened, so we can rebuild the index right away. So that's how the IO plugin works. Um, Here's are the, here are the, the thing, things you can find in those data files. So besides uh, regular resources like PNGs and music and sound effects, you can find also lip sync metadata, which is cool because they use uh, an open source thing to do that. Um, the fonts and also those which are scripts. Um, it's game logic. Uh, those wimpy thing are uses the same format of the index, so that it's the it's that kind of binary dictionary, and uh, so I made a command to convert that to JSON from Radar. Um, problem is uh, those uh, logic files, the binat files, are have a second pass of obfuscation. So uh, what happens is that. Uh, if you don't do the second pass, what I, what I saw, it was just a, an unpleasant uh, high entropy blob. Uh, and I had no idea how to, how to understand what's going on. But I, know, I, I knew that they're using the squirrel language because uh, it's public knowledge, um, which is a scripting language. But I expected it to be like a binary representation, like bytecode or something. But I didn't know. So uh, what I did is to inject errors. So uh, now I can uh, read and write stuff. I, I, I used uh, the plugin to just write random data inside this binat and feed the, the results to the game. And what happens is surprising, because uh, the errors I got, I googled for them, and there was a uh, like, uh, compilation error. So uh, it turns out the squirrel scripts are represented as source code inside. So uh, yeah. Oh, that that uh, disclaimer. It's a spoiler because after I, I managed to do the second pass of obfuscation, I um, 
I found this, uh, which is inside the obfuscated file, so they actually expect that to be the obfuscated at some point. But the, the, uh, the interesting thing is that in the first version there wasn't any. <laughs> they probably added after I published this, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, um, so uh, the Squirrel uh, scripting is uh, open source. So uh, if you go to GitHub, you can find that um, there's only one place in which they actually uh, read the source code uh, bytes in order to compile them. It, it's the lexer, fun the lexer class in the next method. So uh, the next step is to find um, where this stuff is, because probably that's where they plugged in their obfuscation pass. Uh, yeah, yeah, the readf function, actually it's not a method, but it's a function which is can be passed from the outside, so probably there's another place in which the obfuscation can happen, but we don't know yet. So uh, let's find the, <laughs> the lexer here. Um, so here's the squirrel source code. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is the next function we are interested in. So let's go to the to this and seek. So let's see if there's a symbol. Probably not. Let's see if there's the method name. There are some, but it's not our. So let's see if we have at least the invalid character string. Nope. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So the next step is let's find the usages. So maybe they changed this source code, but let's find the usages of next. So it's easy because there's a macro here, which is called uh, a shitload of times here. So we can just find like a string near to one of these usages and see if we are lucky. So, for example, let's find a random like. This unexpected character control. Okay, it's next. It, it's near call to that. So, okay, is there? So, uh, let's see if there's a reference to that. Uh, why is it not going on away? Um, who cares? Yeah, there's a reference and it's only one, that's cool. Let's go there. Uh, no? Okay. So, yeah, this is... Uh, so probably is this, th is this thing. Let's see if uh, we can find the similar stuff near another string, just to be sure. Like new line in a comment, in a constant. Same process. Let's find the reference. Uh, new line in a constant. Yeah, yeah. So th this stuff uh, is here again. So basically, uh, what happens is that probably that next method gets inlined, so we can find that thing uh, a number of times, and uh, the source code slightly changes, but. Uh, we can recognize some similarity. For example, this could be the call to the readf function, so this likely getting a byte from the obfuscated input. And here uh, it's using those funny global variables, and uh, there's also an XOR, so probably we found the, the obfuscation. So let's just look at it uh, more deeply. So here is uh, reading a pointer from a global variable, testing it, which is not now. Uh, then it's reading another an, in, an integer, a 32-bit integer from another global variable, incrementing it and updating it. And then it's dividing that for another uh, global 32-bit uh, integer and taking the remainder. Uh, and that's used to index this first uh, pointer here. So probably this is the table. This is a table, and this is a counter, and this is the size of the table uh, because it's uh, going around it. So uh, we can name the things here. 
uh, X obfuscation table. Uh, like this. So we know that lex obfuscation size is probably this. And when lex obfuscation, let's call it counter, this thing which is gets incremented all the time. Uh, so yeah, uh, now uh, we know this. Let's see if we get this pointer. It's null. So probably somewhere it gets initialized at runtime. Let's find it. So let's find references to this. I expect them to be a lot because it's in line, so probably there's a lot. But fortunately, every reference except the first is just reading it. And the, the first one is assigning it. So probably this is happens in the initialization. So let's go there. So yeah, we found a function that takes three arguments and uses them for uh, initialize those three global variables. So we can use uh, the we can define the type of the function where we are here. So like obfuscation, uh, it's just like C. So uh, table. The first one is the table. The second one uh, is the size which is 30 bit, and the third one is the counter. Uh, okay, now we define the, a function called like this. We can uh, name this function the same name. And uh, we have to reanalyze that. Okay, so. Um, so here, our prototype, the arguments are called like we told him, and here, comments to confirm that this is the thing. So, but we yet don't know which data are used to initialize this, so let's go to see where it's called. Okay, so the first argument is just a, a hard-coded pointer, the se uh, which is the table, probably. This is the size, and the counter, if you remember the offset 20, you remember? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the size of the buffer. So basically, the table is the same for all resources, but uh, the obfuscation starts at uh, offset uh, like the size of the chunk. So that slightly changes for every resource. Um, we can also print the table, which is very useful. Yeah, this is the table. So <laughs> um, by using this knowledge, uh, it's possible to obfuscate also the, 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 the squirrel source code here. So yeah, that's the same thing we just, uh, the, this, those are the similarities between the source code and the inline function we just found. So they choose to actually change the next method instead of using the, uh, the callback. We already talked about this, so we skip it again. <laughs> okay, um, so now we can see actually what's inside that, that resource files. Uh, I can, uh, you can see anything? Okay, so uh, to use the plugin, you can use uh, the ggpack uh, protocol <laughs> and um, uh, it will open the file. I will open it in, in write mode because we are going to change it. Um, so it will take some seconds because it, it's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so if we go visual, we can see uh, here are the flags, one for a, every file which is there. So for example, this is squirrel source code. Uh, it's, it looks very bad, but... Uh, um, Okay, it's like <laughs> and yeah, there are every kind of things. For example, this WIMP is uh, those kind of binary dictionary, which is like exactly like the index. You can do like this uh, and show the JSON, 
representation of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So basically, you have control of a lot of stuff here just to experiment and hack. And um, if you install this plugin using R2PM, there are two scripts which come for free, which are GG import and GG export. For example, now we can run uh, the GG export, which basically um, exports every resource uh, in, into a directory of your choice. Um, yes. So I can just call export. Sorry, I'm a very bad typist. Uh, and this will uh, dump everything. So basically, if you want to change something, the, you can just dump everything, search the things you're interested in, change the uh, thing, and, and import it back with the second script. Um, now let's, let's uh, <laughs> finish this. Uh, it will not take too long, I promise. OK. Um, if you go to the uh, out resources, you can see here there's a lot, a lot of things, like you know resources. <laughs> so um, what I did, I uh, did my homework and I created a modified uh, resource, <laughs> dusting off my shitty art skills. And uh, yeah, but it's a surprise. Uh, don't sh don't show it. And now uh, I can import my modified resource using this. Uh, the gg import script uh, just takes a file, which is uh, I don't remember the name actually. So, uh, which is this. So, if the file has the same name of a file which is found in the in the ggpack file, it will replace it. So, it, taking into account also difference of size, it do, does the insertion, deletion, writing. So it's shif shifting up by those bytes. That, that's because my modified resource is slightly bigger than the original. It will take some time because uh, it's rebuilding the index and shifting everything 500 megabytes. So it will take some few seconds. Yes, it's it's a key. Uh, it's used like this also in the engine. So it's a it, it's a proper dictionary. So mm -hmm. uh, okay. So we modified the file. We can just copy it back in the game. And if I pray the demo gods enough, we can see that. Let's try. Oh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have to close the game because it's spawned by Frida. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Reopen it. <laughs> now it's very fast. Load the game. And uh, actually, RadarCon 1987. <laughs> In theory, I could have also have changed the, the the subtitles, but I didn't do that. Let's find Pancake. No, there's no Pancake. In 1987. Oh, he, probably he's the kid. He's the Batman kid in the 1987. <laughs> so OK, that's it, guys. Please ask me two questions. <laughs> Questions? Hi, uh, thanks uh, for a really good presentation. Um, this is a question I did also yesterday. Sorry if it's uh, repeated, but I'm so I'm very curious about this this thing. Is how long did you spend on investigating and oh, getting this result? 
the equivalent of a couple of weekends. Yeah, it's not hard. I mean, uh, it's not. I'm not dealing with malware. I'm not dealing with uh, uh, games by a big corporation which are indistinguishable from malware, like uh, from an analysis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> Any other question? Thanks. Thank you.